Welcome back to the Darting Through the Faith podcast, and you were probably just listening to a Brother Isaiah song. It's <laughs> the intro to this, so shout out to Brother Isaiah. Or the the rumor I heard was that he was actually ordained a priest, that he's now Father Isaiah. Oh, really? I'm not sure about that. So anyways, Brother Isaiah, Father Isaiah, member of the mm. uh, CFR Franciscans. So. Fun fact about the podcast and the, the song. I am just learning this today, listeners, like the origin of the song and the massive efforts you had to make to get permission to use it on the podcast. Massive efforts, I meaning I sent email. an email <laughs> to the Franciscan group and they said, sure, you can use that for your <laughs> podcast. Ah, so, I had no idea. Yeah. I mean, I knew there was a song, but I didn't like know the origin of mm -hmm. where it came from and all the... Yeah. I mean, I thought about writing okay. the intro music sure. myself, you know, sure. and kind of doing a little ditty on the piano, but... Sure. Dang, my husband, like, what, he aspires to be a jingle writer. Mm. He really does. Wow. He thinks he'd be a really good one. Um, and for the record, he is really good at coming up with really short, catchy things that do not he get is. out of your head anytime soon. So I think he'd be that. good at it. Well, you know, maybe maybe we could start a new something new if, if Tony wants right. to pick up this torch right. and come up with a new jingle. The, the thing, though, is that he's not good at just, like... You ask him, and he's coming up. Like, he's not good at that. He's sure. going to just, you know, he's a free spirit when it comes to jingle writing, and it's just got to hit him on the spot. Yeah. This is a great time for him to come up with songs while there's a lot of campaign slogans in people's yards, because he'll just read the name, and then there'll inevitably be a jingle that goes with, um, vote for so-and-so, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Dinsmore yeah. Township trustee. I saw a couple of those signs around. There is a jingle for one of them. Is there really? I don't know who he officially supports, so I'm not going to sing Do you guys song. live in Dinsmore Township? I don't actually think so. I always get confused what township I live in. Hmm. I always look it up and then I always forget. Hmm. I actually don't think so, though. Okay. Yeah, that would seem a little far mm -hmm. from where mm -hmm. where the Dinsmore Township. Mm -hmm. But so. those are those are the candidates running that yeah. he's got jingles for. So nice. Either of you are looking for some extra promo. I've only seen two people running. There might be more, but uh, yeah. anyway, anyway, that's good stuff. Just so you know, the podcast does not endorse any candidate for Correct. Dinsmore Township right. uh, trustee. Right. So. Right. 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 But we do s support mm -hmm. you to vote no on issue one if you're in the state of Ohio. Absolutely. We, so we support that. We support that. Right. So good. All right. Well, back to our regularly scheduled stuff. Yeah. Right? Back in the swing of things. You just got back from retreat. I did. Yeah. Yeah. And a little, and a little vacation. Mm -hmm. See the, saw the family. Mm -hmm. Saw one of our favorite listeners. Mm -hmm. My sister-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yep. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you need to share the story of how people, the connection people made when you were down in sure. their parishes this weekend. So I, I covered mass at my uh, the parish that my family goes to. So my parents are parishioners, my brother, his wife. They're two kids, mm -hmm. so they're they're all parishioners there, and so the it's the only parish in the whole county. So the parish boundaries cover the whole county. So the pastor sometimes struggles to get away from vacation. Just there's not a whole lot of other priests around. So I told him I'm coming down for the weekend. Be more than happy to cover mass. I'll cover all the masses if you want. Mm -hmm. If you want to get away, and he said sweet. So mm -hmm. I covered uh, the Saturday vigil and then the two Sunday morning masses, all the masses, and mm -hmm. uh, people came up to me and. Uh, they said, oh, hey, it's great to meet you. You're Amy's brother-in-law, right? <laughs> I was like, that's interesting. Just like that was the point of reference that they uh -huh. knew me as her brother-in-law right. when, you know, uh, she just became Catholic a year and a half ago and, you know, jumped two feet into the deep mm -hmm. end of the parish. So mm -hmm. she's a CCD catechist. She's singing in the choir and just a generally friendly person, helps out with coffee and donuts mm -hmm. sometimes. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so um, they didn't say, hey, you're Josh's brother, mm -hmm. or you're, you know, they're, right. so. It, there was probably, was it like a really proud moment? Like, yeah, I am Amy's I am Amy's brother-in-law. Brother -in that's right. I'm really glad that that's how you associate me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. That's now, there's plenty of people that know my parents and sure all thing. that, so, yeah. but it was just funny, yeah. like, the people who came up to say, now you're Amy's brother-in-law. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. One of my proudest titles in that's life. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I had a zinger in the homily prepared for my brother. Oh. But the mass he was at, my niece got a bloody nose right at the start of the gospel. So he had to take her out to take care of that and then, you know, missed it. So oh. it's like, man, the Lord is funny. He is. Mm -hmm. Dang. <laughs> what you going to do? What are you going to do? Know? So you didn't, you didn't say it at all? Oh, no. I, I had to. <laughs> Was it the one you recorded that we can all hear if we go it listen was, to your homilies? It homies? was. Yeah, if you do. On, what is it called again, Grace? 
Homilies and More by Father Sean Wilson. Yeah, so this is the it. homilies, not the more. <laughs> right. <laughs> Good stuff. Great. Wow. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, he did. Mi- he missed it in person, but he can go back and relive it. He could, and I'm sure. And actually, his son was serving mm-hmm. serve mass, so my nephew served mass, and he repeated it mo- many times throughout the day. So my brother knows the joke. Good. He thought it was rather funny. Good. So good. That was worth it. Good. <laughs> good. Right. Yeah. Nice. Mm-hmm. Good. Well then. Yeah, he had the whole family involved. <laughs> Nephew serving, <laughs> sister-in-law singing in the choir, mm-hmm. brothers taking care of the other daughter with a bloody nose, or the daughter with a bloody nose. <laughs> right. So everybody right. had something to do. <laughs> Hands on deck. Out yeah, all that's Wilson's. right. <laughs> that's great. Wow. Well, good. Well, I'm glad it was a good trip. Mm-hmm. Glad you're back. We yeah. are back in the studio for another week. Good stuff to talk about today. That's right. And actually kind of providential. You know, because over the weekend, there was a bit of a... We're talking about safeguarding peace, and there was a bit of an invasion over the weekend. So, yeah. Great. Well... It's kind of providential. One hand throws the dart, but... Another another hand guides it. Yeah, that's for sure. Well, Well, let's pray. Let's do it. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, you sent your Son as the Prince of Peace. We ask that through the, the grace and power of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you may renew the face of the earth that you may send forth your Holy Spirit to renew us with the spirit of peace, with the spirit of fraternity, and with the a spirit of dialogue. And we pray for all of those places that are torn apart by violence, all those places where there is fighting and a lack of peace and security. We pray for all of those listening to this podcast, that you may strengthen them in their love for you and for their neighbor. We ask this all through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So we're in uh, we're in the third section of the cat- catechism on paragraphs twenty three o two to twenty three seventeen, uh, and that third section of the catechism is the moral life. We're specifically on the fifth commandment today: mm-hmm. "Thou shalt not kill." Mm-hmm. And so, of course, there's particular things in this about um, "and thou shalt not kill" about respect for human life, about the dignity of human life. But the this kind of last section, I think it's the last section. Maybe it's not. It is. The last section of the fifth commandment is about like kind of communal uh, thou shalt not kill. So safeguarding peace generally mm-hmm. in, uh, in community and kind of in sins against the fifth commandment, not directly murder, mm-hmm. right? So anger, hatred, those sorts of things. So yeah. two sections, peace and then avoiding war. That's right. So to just recap the fifth commandment way back in the opening of this article, that you shall not kill. You have heard that it was said to the men of old, you shall not kill and whoever kills shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be liable to judgment. So that's, of course, quoting our Lord's words in Matthew chapter Mm -hmm. five. Okay. So the first section, as you mentioned in this safeguarding piece is peace. What is peace? peace? Defining peace. That's 2302 to 2306. By recalling the commandment, you shall not kill, our Lord asked for peace of heart and denounced murderous anger and hatred as immoral. Anger is a desire for revenge. To desire vengeance in order to do evil to someone who should be punished is illicit, but it is praiseworthy to impose restitution to correct vices and maintain justice. Right. So basically action against somebody who's hurt you or somebody that you care about to just get back at them is is anger and that's sinful. But if it's to restore what has been lost, that's okay. Right. Mm -hmm. So we think about that even in terms of uh, in terms of maybe just like sentencing a criminal. Mm -hmm. Right. If somebody does something uh, grievous, something harmful, let's say hypothetically they stole a large amount of money, Mm -hmm. to torture them, to kind of get revenge on them is not what the catechism is asking us to do. Make restitution, right, to to be able to, and to heal the person who's going through this, whatever it is, whether that means they need to be imprisoned to protect the society so they don't do it again, or they need to be able to pay back what they have, what they have stolen. So Mm -hmm. to Anger is basically this desire for revenge, and uh, and that is sinful. And even if anger, it says, reaches the point of a deliberate desire to kill or serious wound a neighbor, it's gravely against charity. Mm-hmm. And then even as you, you, it quotes, I think that which you quoted earlier, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Mm-hmm. Right, from, uh, Matthew five. Yep, that's, that's from the, right. Uh, Sermon on the Mount. It's reminding me how the Lord dealt with us, you know, in the garden. At, at the fall, 
you know? Yeah. We disobey, we, we, we make that mistake. And his anger was not just one of like punishment and wrath and mm -hmm. how dare you and now I'm going to kill you. Right. But one of the goal of this is peace of heart and trust in me. And so there's, there's restitution that needs to be paid. There's mm -hmm. realities, there's consequences to what happened, but only meant to restore you to the fullness of my grace. Right. Yeah. And that actually is sometimes hard to read the Bible in that way. Because mm -hmm. when you read that story in the garden, you're like, oh, he's telling the man that you're going to have to work. Mm -hmm. And he's telling the woman that you're going to have pains and labor. And mm -hmm. it'd be like, oh, that's the punishment, right? Mm -hmm. That's the Lord getting his revenge on his people. And actually, I don't think that's probably what's being asked is saying, mm -hmm. this is actually going to help heal you. Mm -hmm. You by working and sacrificing yourself, whether it's in the pains of labor, which mm -hmm. I'm not going to even act like I know <laughs> what that's like, or in the, the pains of a day-to-day -day just labor mm -hmm. and work, mm -hmm. um, that's actually how you're going to be redeemed. That's not the punishment. That's actually how you're going to be changed by yeah. embracing that. Yeah, so. how we learn to love, Yeah, you know, to, to right. give ourselves for the sake of another and um, like God loves us. Right, yeah. how we learn to love, well right. put. Um, deliberate hatred is contrary to charity. Hatred of the neighbor is a sin when one deliberately wishes him evil. Hatred of the neighbor is a grave sin when one deliberately desires him grave harm. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Right. Mm -hmm. So hatred, wishing evil upon somebody, right? Wishing somebody might lose their job as a comeuppance or have bad things happen mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. Not that you're going to do it yourself, but mm -hmm. if something bad happens, I'm going to mm -hmm. take a little bit of joy in it. Mm -hmm. And that happens sometimes in our lives, and so we kind of got to, kind of got to seek that out in our hearts to know we what's do. what's going on, what's going awry. Yeah, I recognize that that's like a little poison. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's okay to like it's okay to come face to face with that and recognize right. that ooh, I'm having that temptation or even that desire to like I'm so hurt that I want you to hurt too mm -hmm. type of a thing. Um, and I don't think that reality should scare us so much as like to recognize like, Ooh, that's a reality. I I'm really going to need healed. And yeah. this is beyond anything I can do right. for myself. And this is what draws us to the Lord because mm -hmm. <laughs> we recognize how far we are from him, how far our hearts are from him. Right. Yeah. So, um, respect for and development of human life require peace. Peace is not merely the absence of war, and it is not limited to maintaining a balance of powers between adversaries. Peace cannot be attained on earth without safeguarding the goods of persons, free communication among men, respect for the dignity of persons and peoples, and the assiduous practice of fraternity. Peace is the tranquility of order. Peace is the work of justice and the effect of charity. Ooh, peace is the effect of charity, mm -hmm. charity being love, true love. So if we learn to love, we learn to love our neighbor, love ourselves um, as, as God loves us, love our neighbor that way, peace will be the effect of that. Mm -hmm. And so a lack of peace is like a symptom saying, oop, our hearts aren't quite where they need to be. <clears throat> right. Yeah. And even this is kind of talking about like com communally, right? Sure. Like So yeah. when we work in charity towards each mm -hmm. other, like if, if everybody's doing that, peace will be the effect. Mm -hmm. And even if we're working for justice, right? So if, if our peace is the work of justice and the effect of charity. So if we're working for justice to make things fair, to make sure people get what, what is their due, and if we do that in charity and in love, that, that the effect will be peace. And mm. that should be kind of self-evident in our sure. own experience. Right. You get that in a family. Like if everybody kind of gets what their due is, people try to strive towards charity, there's peace in a home. Mm -hmm. And then you take that into a larger um, society. That's mm -hmm. basically the goal. Yeah. Okay. Earthly peace is the image and fruit of the peace of Christ, <clears throat> the messianic prince of peace. <clears throat> By the blood of his cross in his own person, he killed the hostility. He reconciled men with God and made his church the sacrament of unity of the human race and of its union with God. He is our peace. He has declared, blessed are the peacemakers. How about that line, though? By the blood of his mm -hmm. cross in his own person, he killed hostility. Mm -hmm. So by taking in like <clears throat> anger and vengeance inside his self, it's through that incredible like acceptance of it that he kills hostility. Mm -hmm. um, that's remarkable. It really is. So it shows like through Christ is how we're really going to find peace mm -hmm. and not through our own effort. Mm -hmm. But if all of us look to the Lord and to 
embrace his power in the sacraments and the love and the charity that transforms hearts. That's mm-hmm. how peace is really going to happen, not just mm-hmm. uh, the, the best political programs or our own effort or whatever it may mm-hmm. be. Yeah. I'm like thinking about like, is there like, <laughs> I'm not a boxer. I aspire to be one in no. <laughs> really? <laughs> no, I Let's don't. just pause here for a little bit. I don't. We're going to just stop the recording, <laughs> have a little conversation and we'll start over. But isn't there something about like when like, you know, somebody is giving the punch and when somebody receives it to like, like you can't like be a wall that just like it bounces off. Like you have to like absorb it in a mm. way. Like, is that not I, a reality? I, I, no not one knows box, anything about I'm not boxing a boxer. and yeah. punching and receiving. No. Okay, well that's fine. No, in fun fact, my you my could call uh, Father Michael Willig. Oh, is he a boxer? No, but he was a wrestler <laughs> okay. and did all sorts of like jujitsu stuff. Ooh, okay. Yeah. He's my expert. I'll have to yeah. phone a friend. My ne- my niece had got like a virtual reality thing, brought it on vacation this year, and one of them was like a punching game. So mm. I was like dying laughing. My sister put it on, and she's freaking out, moving around, and like. So, of course, I want to try. And I no more than put the thing on. I'm standing in the ring, and this guy comes at me, and I just rip it off and say, no. I'm not even... <laughs> not even <laughs> virtually even, getting punched. Not even vir- he looked really scary. No, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, that, so my yeah. aspirations of a boxer would not go far, is what I'm sure. saying. Sure. <laughs> okay. But anyway, if you just remind me of that, like, that, that line of... of uh, he killed the hostility and you saying that like he received it all yeah. and it was taken to the cross and mm. um, yeah, like anyway, like he received all that anger and hostility and, and killed it right there on the cross. Right. That's just beautiful. Okay. Those who renounce violence and bloodshed and in order to safeguard human rights, make use of those means of defense available to the weakest, bear witness to evangelical charity, provided they do so without harming the rights and obligations of other men and societies. They bear legitimate witness to the gravity of the physical and moral risks of recourse to violence with all its destruction and death. Those who renounce violence and bloodshed bear witness to evangelical charity. They bear legitimate witness to the gravity of the physical and moral risks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking of, there's a, uh, there's a, you know, those lighthouse talks where mm-hmm. people kind of get involved in, mm-hmm. or people basically tell their witness story in mm-hmm. some of them. Mm-hmm. And so there's one, I think it's by Joseph Pierce, who was basically involved in like the, an Irish gang mm-hmm. militia. And, uh, and then his conversion story of those who, somebody who renounces violence, right. Who had participated in a life of violence. Mm. Like, so somebody who experienced it firsthand is able to tell the gravity of the violence and of Mm. the, um, the seriousness of, of Mm. anger, hatred, vengeance, and all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And also the power of the cross. Right. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Who's the Marian priest who had a radical conversion to? Oh, yeah. Father Donald Calloway. Yeah. yeah, his story's in there, too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah be a good one to check out, too. Um, okay. And then the, the last few paragraphs are in the section um, Avoiding War. That mm-hmm. would be 2307 to 2317. Sure. The fifth commandment forbids the intentional destruction of human life. Because of the evils and injustices that accompany all war, the church insistently urges everyone to prayer and to action so that the divine goodness may free us from the ancient bondage of war. Right. War's mm-hmm. been with us a long time. Mm-hmm. But divine goodness, we want to, to free mm-hmm. us from that. Mm-hmm. So in 23 it continues that all citizens and all governments are obliged to work for the avoidance of war. So what is... I, maybe even like the church speaking to like kind of political things and things of the world. This is part of the t- church's teaching role, right? The church isn't trying to get involved and say, let let the Bishop of Washington, D.C., the Archbishop of Washington, D.C., be the president and let him do things on behalf of the church. But it's part of the church's teaching of the moral order, that because God has revealed these things, this is how we ought to behave in terms of war, in terms of in terms of peace. So that's what the church is doing. She's proposing, she's teaching based on God revealing himself to us in Jesus Christ, how we ought to live together as, as nations. So mm-hmm. It's not the church trying to like take over politics and, you know, but there isn't this radical separation of church and state. The church actually has a voice to speak um, because of the wisdom of the centuries, the power of the Holy Spirit and the revelation of God. So maybe just like. Very well said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this goes on to um, 
just be more specific about what this all means. However, as long as the danger of war persists and there is no international authority with the necessary competence and power, governments cannot be denied the right of lawful self-defense once all peace efforts have failed. Right. <clears throat> so that was the end of 2308. And then mm-hmm. 2309 goes through what it says at the end of the paragraph is the traditional el- elements called just war doctrine. So mm-hmm. how could how could a, a country, how could a group actually enter into an armed conflict, right? Mm-hmm. And so there's certain things that um, that the church proposes kind of test to say if this war is just or not. Mm-hmm. So it's a grave decision, first of all, right? Anytime you're sending people that there's a likelihood that many are going to die, right? It's got to be serious, right? It's not on a whim. It's not, Mm. um, yeah. At one and the same time, so all these conditions Mm -hmm. would... would, Four conditions, I believe. would be present. The damage inflicted by the aggressor on the nation or community of nations must be lasting, grave, and certain, All other means of putting an end to it have been shown to be impractical or ineffective. There must be serious prospects of success. The use of arms must not produce evils and disorders graver than the evil to be eliminated. The power of modern means of destruction weighs very heavily in evaluating this condition. Right. So that's basically the the church proposing those four things. Mm So first of all, it's self-defense. So somebody's been invaded, right? There is no just war doctrines for when you can invade a neighbor, right? Mm-hmm. So this is this is defense against somebody, a, a country, a nation, a community who's being <clears throat> the aggressor. Mm-hmm. Um, lasting, grave, and certain, right? So there's, I mean, in some ways, this ring. You know, there's so many historical examples that can come to mind. Mm-hmm. So maybe it's best not to just go through them all, but. Mm-hmm. Cuz in some ways they speak for themselves. So 2309 in the catechism if you want to if you want to go there yourself and read those. The just war doctrine. And then yep. like you said the the evaluation of these conditions for moral legitimacy belongs to the prudential, prudential judgment of those who have responsibility for the common good. Right. So it, it wouldn't it wouldn't be the right thing for the um for let's say the president of the United States to go to the Archbishop of Washington D.C. to say, "Hey, is this a just war?" Mm-hmm. Right? Because the Archbishop of D.C. does not know how certain the effects are. Does not know if everything has been, pre- if all of the other means of resolution have been proven ineffectual or impractical. So what the Church does is to form the consciences, hopefully, of those who are in leadership positions, those who have to make these decisions. So it's not to say, hey, tell me it's okay for me to do this. Well, no, that's not the Church's role. It's actually to form the conscience of the leader who's who's making the decisions because they're going to have all of the information, right? The Archbishop of Washington, D.C. does not have all of the military intel that the Commander-in-Chief of the United States has. Mm-hmm. So... <clears throat> Makes sense. Yeah. Public authorities in this case have the right and duty to impose on citizens the obligations necessary for national defense. Those who are sworn to serve their country in the armed forces are servants of the security and freedom of nations. If they carry out their duty honorably, they truly contribute to the common good of the nation and the maintenance of peace. Right. So basically the, the country has a, a responsibility, in some ways a duty to help the national defense and to ask its citizens to participate. Mm-hmm. Now the next paragraph talks about those who refuse based on their conscience on the refuse to bear arms. So maybe you think about the, the story highlighted in that movie. Um, oh, gosh. Hacksaw Ridge, where the Desmond Doss is a conscientious objector, and so he serves as a as a paramedic mm. in there to, because he wanted to heal, not to kill. Okay, mm. well, he's participating. He's, um, yeah. <clears throat> but nonetheless, it mentions in here, obliged to serve the human community in some other way. Gotcha. So. Mm-hmm. The church and human reason both assert the permanent validity of the moral law during armed conflict. The mere fact that war has regrettably broken out does not mean that everything becomes licit between the warring parties. Pretty obvious, but that means, let's say the, the, the president of the country decides this is a just war and we actually ought to do this. Mm-hmm. Well, that doesn't mean everything's off limits. So the soldiers go in and then they can pillage, steal, and take from whatever because this is a time of war and they can kill whomever they want mm-hmm. and do whatever they want to all the citizens. Mm-hmm. No, that everything's not all of a sudden okay because mm-hmm. you're at war. Mm-hmm. 
Um, yeah, and that, that continues in 2313. Non-combatants, wounded soldiers, prisoners must be respected and treated humanely. Um, actions deliberately contrary to the law of nations and to its universal principles are crimes, as are the orders that command such actions. So that's that's looking especially towards like genocide, right? So if the orders are given to wipe out a particular group of people, Mm -hmm. you know, to make an example of them or something like that, or because there's hatred between, right? One is not obliged to blindly follow everything. So Mm -hmm. those sorts of things, one is actually obliged not to follow Mm -hmm. those things. So one is morally bound to resist orders that command genocide, the catechism Mm -hmm. says. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Going on, every act of war directed to the indiscriminate destruction of whole cities or vast areas with their inhabitants is a crime against God and man, which merits firm and unequivocal condemnation. condemnation. Thank you. A danger of modern warfare is that it provides the opportunity to those who possess modern scientific weapons, especially atomic, biological, or chemical weapons, to commit such crimes. Right. So acts of war that are just generally going to wipe out Mm -hmm. places, people, Mm -hmm. areas Mm -hmm. should be avoided. Mm -hmm. Then we get into the accumulation of arms strikes many as a paradoxical, paradoxically suitable way of deterring potential adversaries from war. They see it as the most effective means of ensuring peace among nations. This method of deterrence gives rise to strong moral reservations. The arms race does not ensure peace. Far from eliminating the causes of war, it risks aggravating them. Spending enormous sums to produce ever new types of weapons impedes efforts to aid needy populations. It thwarts the development of peoples. Overarmament multiplies reasons for conflict and increases the danger of escalation. Right. So there's this idea that if we just get more weapons, people will be intimidated and be like, whew, we're not going to fight them. Look how many weapons they have. But that actually, well, if all you're doing is producing the next greatest weapon, that's where your attention, your funds and time is going. Well, there's a lot of other things that means we're not doing, Mm -hmm. you know, and um, and that also seems to uh, increase danger in Mm -hmm. uh, reasons for conflict. Mm -hmm. So I think Tony Stark learned that. In the Iron Man series. That, that is something that Tony Stark, right. right? He thought having all of his... Was that Iron Man 3 where he had all of his different Iron Men? I don't know. But I think that that's where Tony yeah. Stark began was producing <laughs> weapons for war, right? And right. he had like a conversion of heart that, ooh, that's not maybe where I... Right. <laughs> so you learn a lot from should, the Iron Man movies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm even thinking of Ultron, right? Like he, Ultron was created that he was going to be uh, able to ensure peace. War machine. But then... Or, yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Now I'm singing one of my husband's jingles in my head. Oh, no. About All right, let's War move. Machine. We wow. got to move on. Yeah. <laughs> the production and sale of arms affect the common good of nations and the international community. So since public authorities have a right and duty to regulate them. So there's responsibility to regulate the private use of arms. You know, mm. the short-term pursuit of private or collective interest cannot legitimate, cannot legitimate undertakings that promote violence and conflict among nations and compromise the inner juridical order. Mm. So everybody having guns and tanks and everything else is not a great way of preserving peace. Okay. Tony Stark taught yeah. us that. No, just but I, the message is in there if you watch them. Um, injustice, excessive economic or social inequalities, envy, distrust, and pride raging among men and nations constantly threaten peace and cause wars. Everything done to overcome these disorders contributes to building up peace and avoiding war. So that's really just black and white and calling a spade a spade. These are disorders of right. our heart going back to where we began. Mm-hmm. So it's not just you know, God telling us don't fight each other because it's not good. Don't fight. But right. I've made you for more. I've made you for right. love. I've made you for peace and watch out for these things because it will lead to war. If you're, if there's not peace in your heart. Yeah. yeah. And the root of war is a lack of virtue and a lack of, a lack of or an excessive sin mm-hmm. or even, you know, whether that's societally, right. Mm-hmm. The, the proud have trampled over the weak and now the weak are going to, you mm-hmm. know, rise up and revolt. Or even if there's, Envy or distress or pride, right? Like, we're this great nation. We should, you know, hypothetically, America, you know, we're, we're better than Canada. We should just take over Canada. Mm, I'm not saying that. No, That's right. just like an example like a of pride. Muscle thing. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
Stupid. So. That's what that is. Um, <laughs> Stupid. That is what that is. Yes. Uh, so the last paragraph here, what document is this coming from? Uh, um, uh, Gaudium et Spes. It's one of the uh, documents of the Second Vatican Council. So this is this ends really beautifully. Insofar as men are sinners, the threat of war hangs over them and will so continue until Christ comes again. But insofar as they can vanquish sin by coming together in charity, violence itself will be vanquished, and these words will be fulfilled. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against a nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And that's, of course, quoting Isaiah chapter mm-hmm. 2. Beautiful. Yeah, let's beat them swords into plowshares. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Get these disorders in our hearts right. rightly ordered. Through Christ, so, yeah. You yeah. think of it even about that, like taking the swords and turning it into farming equipment, mm-hmm. right? Like, what if all of the technology we used for war was that was actually used to help feed hungry people and to farm better, right? There'd be far less hungry people. Far less hungry people. <laughs> yeah. Right. All right, we're gonna cross it off. Is that a? Yes, is that that? I think that's that, and we keep dwindling down here. It's really amazing how how many we have crossed off the old dartboard, but there's still a few remaining. You got your eyes set on any? I don't. But I'm just gonna kind of look and see where we uh, where we is there a bunch maybe or a, a grouping <laughs> of ones to make it that easy? I am. Uh, how about that, huh? Yeah. Oh. I don't know. Saw one up there on the upper oh, decker. Oh, I didn't see that. Okay. Oh, that was interesting right there. This is going to get more and more fun as we go on. Because it's going to get harder and harder. Fun? Ooh, the Ten Commandments in general. Nice. 2052 to 2074. That's a, that's a big honker right there. 23 <laughs> paragraphs. 2352 to 20, 2052 to 2074. Big honker. Big old honking. <laughs> honking section. That's good stuff. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so I'm just going to end with the Beatitudes, you know, the blessed are the peacemakers and all this paradoxical way of living and we can never hear this too much. So Matthew chapter five, verses one through 12, when he saw the crowds, he went up the mountain and after he had sat down, his disciples came to him. He began to teach them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven. Thus they persecuted the prophets who were before you. 